they cost me a $400,000 bonus if I would have started one more game. And they knew that, I knew that, but they wouldn't tell me that. And uh, I was really angry with them. Uh, I sat out for three days, I actually protested. And I was playing golf up at Estancia Golf Course up in uh, Scottsdale. It was, it was the greatest week of my life. Um, so I went back on Friday, got a standing ovation from the team because they all knew why I was doing what I was doing. And then unfortunately, I never saw my second year there. I went back to Cincinnati because the Cardinals had had enough of me at that point. So th those are my memories. <laughs>
uh, as the starting quarterback over Kent Graham. I got benched after two and a half games. And uh, for two games there, I think out of the first three, if I remember correctly, Vince Tobin, our head coach, kept benching me. And that was the story in the newspaper on Monday. And the talk shows, they bench Boomer again, they bench Boomer again. And meanwhile, the whole team was playing terrible. And I remember walking into his office saying, Vince, look, man, you got to stop benching me because every time you bench me, now you give everybody an excuse in that locker room not to hold up their end of the bargain. So I said, look, do me a favor. Either stick with me and say you're going to stick with me or bench me for good and go ahead and play Kent. Little did I know that he was going to take me literally and go ahead and bench me for real and then go play Kent. So he played Kent and Kent uh, got hurt. And then I took over again and went on an unbelievable run for three weeks there. We were one of the best offenses in football and we truly found our rhythm. And unfortunately, we lost the game in Minnesota, I believe, that cost us a chance for the playoffs. And with two games left, they decided to go back to Kent. But by doing that, they cost me a $400,000 bonus if I would have started one more game. And they knew that. I knew that. But they wouldn't tell me that. And uh, I was really angry with them. Uh, I sat out for three days. I actually protested. And I was playing golf up at Estancia Golf Course up in uh, Scottsdale. It was, it was the greatest week of my life. Um, so I went back on Friday, got a standing ovation from the team because they all knew why I was doing what I was doing. And then, unfortunately... I never saw my second year there. I went back to Cincinnati because the Cardinals had had enough of me at that point. So th those are my memories. <laughs> so is the is the bill still out there? Do they still owe you the the four hundred thousand? Whatever whatever happened there? You know, I filed a grievance. Uh, never heard anything about the grievance, and the grievance is probably still in effect to this day. But uh, I figured I'd move on from that. And uh, quite frankly, Michael Bidwell, every time I see him, he's very nice to me. And I think it really took Michael to get this organization from where it was into the next century. And with that beautiful new stadium out there, and then, of course, the success that they had with Carson and Kurt Warner and everything else, we are miles away from where we were back in 1996. Uh, and, and take me into just the, the yo-yoing of, of quarterback. I mean, you, you were an NFL MVP. You went to the Super Bowl. You, you, you went to your hometown Jets. You ended up out here in the desert. You were getting benched and, and going <laughs> through that adversity. How much does the, the, the low points in that story help you with the show you're doing here on Arizona's Family and teasing out what – what people's stories are and what makes people tick. I, I certainly can commiserate with a lot of my guests. There's no question about that. And we have a lot in common. You know, there are a lot of people that didn't think that I was going to be able to make it. A lot of the guests that come on here tell me about their backstories, where they come from, you know, who in their life was important to their success and how they made it. We you know we had Austin Eckler on uh, this past week and his story is totally amazing. I mean, he, he grew up in a farm in Colorado, went to Western Colorado, didn't get invited to the Combines, was signed as an undrafted free agent for San Diego and just signed a four-year, $25 million contract extension. So those are the types of stories that we look for. And, you know, that's kind of like my backstory as well. But I always say this about an NFL quarterback. If you want them to be successful, the most important attribute that any organization can have is stability. And stability has to be at the top. It has to come from ownership to the general manager to the coach. And they all have to be in sync. So I, I was with the Jets. I had three coaches in three years. Uh, I was with the Cardinals for one year. So that was a different head coach. And then I went back to Cincinnati and had another head coach my final year. So uh, it wasn't the, the best way to be successful towards the end of my career. But the first part of my career with Sam Weish and the Cincinnati Bengals certainly was the most memorable part. Do you think the Cardinals can take a step forward this year and, and, and kick the door into the playoffs based on that stability? You know, they're close. And I know that they go out and get A.J. Green and J.J. Watt and Malcolm Butler for a reason. Those guys are great pros. And much like when I went to the desert towards the latter part of my career, you know, they're relying on their pro experience to bring a locker room together and, and, and fight for one another and teach players how to become teammates and take some of that pressure off of Kyler Murray. You know, they're in the toughest division in football as we get ready to start the season. Now, that could change due to injuries as we see throughout the year, and especially with 17 games this year. Uh, Kyler has got to take the next step. If they want to be a serious contender, he's got to turn into Russell Wilson. I don't care. You know, that's the perfect example. You know, Russell Wilson was great when he was young, and then he finally refined his game. He's about the same size as Kyler. And, uh, you know, he's right there. He sees him twice a year. It's going to be uh, the perfect example for who Kyler Murray should try to become as an NFL quarterback. What's it like being on the set 
at, at, at CBS on Sundays watching the NFL. You're in, you're in the booth some as well. And then taking that into your show during the week and, and bringing it to us on here on Arizona's Family. What, how do you watch an NFL Sunday and what kind of storylines are you looking for that will appear on Arizona's Family in, in your well, show? I'll, t- I'll tell you, you know, I sit there with Phil Sims, Coach Cower, and Nate Burleson, and uh, all three guys are just terrific football guys. They all have such knowledge. And we're bantering back and forth offset. I wish they would actually show what we do offset because it's pretty funny the way that we interact with one another, depending on whatever games we're watching. But we're always looking for the top end stories. We're always, you know, when Kyler was the first overall pick for Arizona and he started, you know, that's one of the you know leading stories going into the year two years ago. So now as we get ready to move into 2021, you know, you got Sam Darnold down in Carolina, you got Zach Wilson, you got Trevor Lawrence, you got Zach, uh, uh, Mac Jones, I mean, you got Daniel Jones. Jones here in New York. You got all these great young quarterbacks. And then, of course, you have the old standbys like Aaron Rodgers and Ben Roethlisberger and, and Tom Brady, for sure. And Patrick Mahomes now is an old standby. Derek Carr is an old standby. I mean, so there's so many great young players in this league right now. I, I just think for us at CBS on a daily basis every Sunday, uh, there's never a dull moment and there's never a non-story Sunday. There's always something to talk about. Have you picked up a copy of Tom Brady's book and thought, man, if I could go back in time and hand this to myself in 1997, I might still be playing? You know what? Um, if I were making 25 to $40 million a year, I still would be playing. You know, when I left the Cardinals, and the reason I got so mad about that $400,000 is because they were only paying me $800,000 that year. So that 400000 was a third of my paycheck. <laughs> so I, I wanted that, and I needed that, but they didn't want to pay it to me. So uh, these guys today have taken control of their own careers like I've never seen before, and I'm happy for them because we went on strike in 1987. I was one of those player representatives that had to lead that strike and although it may have failed at the time it basically has turned into you know a windfall for today's players there's no question about that and it will even get better and stronger as they move on and they become more aware of what the opportunities are and how much money they should be paid for the obvious uh, risks that they're taking, especially in a 17-game season. Well, you certainly helped pave the way for it. Uh, will Icky Woods make an appearance on the show here on Arizona's Family? Uh, he may. I mean, he's one of the guys that, obviously, that I played with way back in the day, had the Icky Shuffle, was like a, almost like a one-hit wonder. Unfortunately, he got hurt. Uh, but he is a great personality, and you just gave me an idea for a great show, so thank you. Uh, how about Ray Horton and Ricky Dixon? I, I contend I was, it was, it was, what, 1989? I had yes. my 3D glasses for the halftime show. I was real into the, the the Super Bowl. It was the year you won MVP, if I'm not mistaken. If Jerry Rice scores with a minute to play, you get the ball back with more time. Do you think you're you're holding a Super Bowl ring on your finger if you would have had of a little more I, time? Yeah, of course I do. Of course I of course I believe that. You know, and uh, yeah, Ray was a great safety of ours. Ricky was a terrific uh, defensive back, a young defensive back. It might have been his rookie year. I, I, we, he uh, passed with ALS, unfortunately, but um, I do remember uh, I do remember Lewis Billups having a ball hit him right in the chest on the I think it was the second to last drive that the 49ers had in that game. And unfortunately, he has since passed, but he did not catch that interception. That could have changed the whole dynamic of that game as well, because I think the 49ers kicked the field goal at that moment. Uh, in the game so there are a lot of things you look back on Uh, I have no regrets Uh, it was a great it was a great run for me and to be able to be a part of at least one Super Bowl and I think most players will tell you this that uh, it was a a memory of a lifetime and I got another idea for you John Taylor last I heard was a long-haul trucker I don't know if he's still doing it but uh, if you guys could get I've been trying to track him down for years his nephews live here and coach high school football and they're like oh I just came through town uh, he, he drives coast to coast, or at least he did. Um, uh, as far as um, just just the NFL goes this year, uh, are we looking at, 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 I mean, you think we're poised for a rematch in the Super Bowl between uh, the Chiefs and the Buccaneers? What, what do you expect to happen over a 17-game season? Well, they, they, those two guys, uh, those two teams are going to be two of the top four teams coming into the season. And again, you know, 17 games, man, it's crazy. Uh, you know, nobody's playing in the preseason right now because these coaches realize that 17 games is going to be a marathon and just that one extra game. Even in the past years, I remember week 14, 15, and 16, you see shell of teams because uh, so many guys are hurt. Um, you know, Tampa Bay and uh, and Kansas City are going to be right there at, at, the, at the forefront of, of the line, but there are other teams that are coming, you know, other teams that, you know, had injuries last year that are going to be better. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something here. I think the Bengals are going to be shockingly 
pretty good. You know, I'm you know nine and eight is what I'm saying for the Cincinnati Bengals, and maybe that gets them a wild card. Yeah, I, I just think that you know there's so many variables that are going into this season that we're not aware of just yet. That uh, it is going to be, as they always say, a marathon. Who wins more games this year, the Arizona Cardinals or the Cincinnati Bengals? I say the Bengals. So that Believe would be that would be eight and nine for the Cardinals. Does does that get them into the playoffs? <laughs> it may. I mean, think about what we just said: eight and nine and nine and eight. We have to get used to saying numbers like that because obviously the first year with seventeen games. But, um, you know, they're, they're like both of those teams are like middle of the pack teams. And I know that with guys like A.J. Green and J.J. Watt and Malcolm Butler, you know, Chandler Jones and Kyler Murray and Larry Fitzgerald and DeAndre Hopkins, you're saying, OK, this is an all star team. This should be a really good team. Uh, but the problem is, is that, you know, they're going to see Matthew Stafford now at the Rams. They'll be better offensively. A healthy Russell Wilson is going to be very difficult to deal with, you know. And then, of course, you know, you're going to have great defenses. San Francisco should be better. They didn't, you know, they had just a terrible injury run last year. And if they get, you know, Joe, uh, Nick Bosa back, uh, they're going to be they're going to be tough to deal with off uh, defensively. So I, I just think that whole division is going to be beating itself up. And, and you mentioned Larry, and we've been kind of uh, th that's been the hot storyline out here. He said he doesn't have the urge to play. He's not retired. He's doing radio with Tom Brady and Jim Gray. You mentioned the injuries late in the year. He's entering his 18th NFL season. hasn't showed up for training camp yet. If a guy hasn't retired by now, do you think he still could end up playing this season? What, what do you think it looks like for Larry Fitzgerald uh, when this season's all said and done? Well, that's why I bring up his name. The fact of the matter is, is that, you know, why does a guy like him have to go through training camp? Uh, I, to me, the Arizona Cardinals have him in their back pocket if they need him. And maybe they don't need him. Uh, and maybe they won't need him. But maybe there's also a chance that in the middle of the season, somebody goes down at the wide receiver position. How great would it be able to just pick a guy off the street by the name of Larry Fitzgerald and say, go out there and play with Kyler Murray? And, and how great would that be for Cardinals and their fans? I, I, to me, that's still a possibility. I still believe that there's a chance he can play. What about their quarterback from 96? How many throws does he have left in his arm? Zero. <laughs> I'm a hell of a lot smarter than I was back then. Uh, I did see, are you about to become a grandfather? Is that correct? Well, I'm already one uh, in uh, with the grandchild. Uh, my daughter had a, a, a daughter herself last year. Her name is Winnie and my son Gunner, uh, who has cystic fibrosis and his wife are expecting in December which is amazing. There's been major breakthroughs in the world of cystic fibrosis. Cardinal fans remember that, you know, obviously uh, at the age of, I think, five, uh, he was when I was playing for the Cardinals. He is now 30. He's married. He's getting his master's degree at Dartmouth. And there was a major breakthrough about five years ago in cystic fibrosis. And one of those uh, has helped him become the uh, biological father of his son to be born in December, which is really uh, a miracle. That That's so cool. And I think we, we all kind of followed your story during your playing days with Gunner. I mean, if I would have told you when you, I think you were with the Jets at the time and you had to leave practice and it was a, a major national story, uh, that, that, that you would be a grandfather to his son, what would you have told me? Um, I would have said my hopes and dreams uh, would be met because – uh, after every dinner, golf tournament, fundraiser that I've ever been to over the last 27 years, I always end all the speeches with, my goal in life is to have my son outlive me and then become a father himself. And uh, he's got one of those goals on the way right now. And like I said, he just turned 30. His life has changed around and uh, he's living the good life. And, and he's really become the advocate that I had hoped that he would be for CF patients on Twitter, you can follow him at Gunnar Esaias in 17, and uh, he's all over social media in the world of cystic fibrosis. So he's out there still fighting the fight, and I couldn't be any prouder. All right, he'll be the next guest we have to book here on on the show here. Uh, just for you, the show, what's it what's it look like this fall? Is uh, will will Gunnar make an appearance? Do you have any uh, well, <laughs> Coach Coward? Does he come in? Do you bring in the whole CBS crew and get like a right, bleep I, button? I, How's it go? I, I, I've already had Coach Cower and Phil Sims on. We will have people, <clears throat> you know, from the NHL, from Major League Baseball. You know, today I'm getting ready to interview Derek Carr. Uh, we'll have John Meads from the Orioles. We'll have Al Gerev from uh, the Tennis World. Uh, we'll have Kyle Busch from NASCAR. I mean, so there's a ton of people coming up, interesting people, and it's about them and their backgrounds and how they got to be so successful. What, what, when you look at the key to most of them, the common thread, what, what are some of the lessons that you've learned that will go in the Boomer Esiason Keys to Success coffee table book one day? 
Well, just like me, they had somebody in their life that pushed them when they were younger, either a mom or a dad or both. Uh, and every single athlete that I've ever had on, Olympian, professional athlete, you name it, gives thanks to their parents and how important their parents were in their development. And uh, whether it be, like I said, a mom, a dad, in my case it was a dad because my mom died when I was seven, uh, but uh, you always have to have somebody in, in your background. And then there was a coach along the way that saw something special in each and every one of them. And I didn't even realize this, that you know there are driving coaches for kids who ride on dirt tracks when they're 13 years old, you know, in go-karts. Who knew that? I didn't even know that. So uh, everybody has somebody in their life. And, and my, my message would be, you be that somebody in somebody's life. Pay it forward, give it back. And most of the athletes that we talk to have done that. And you were, what, a, th a three-sport uh, athlete uh, growing up. Now you see the specialization of it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at youth sports and, and, and the roadmap and what it looks like now to get to the pros, uh, what do you think about, about how that all goes down with the specialization? You know, I always say let kids be kids. Before you get them into, uh, you know, pitching class or, you know, basketball shooting class, let them be kids, man. Let them play with their buddies out on the street. Now, unfortunately, in today's day and age, the video game, craze has taken over the kids have got to get outside they got to interact this is why it's so important that i believe that kids have to be in school even in light of covid 19 you know they have to be able to interact they have to be able to play and the last thing i ever want to see is a school closed down seasons canceled you know kids have got to grow emotionally and they have to be allowed to do it on their own terms as opposed to being force fed something if they don't love it. Now, if your kid loves something so much and so passionate about it, then I can understand individual coaching and that I do agree with. All right. Uh, I'm going to have my kids. Uh, they play outside. They like to play a lot of Madden. I'm going to have them dial up the 1996 Cardinals. Does that work? It works, and they're going to see a guy in there that can sling it, at least with one hand, left-handed. <laughs> well, awesome. I, I really enjoyed this conversation and uh, appreciate it. Is there anything else you'd, you'd like to, to tell the audience before we let you go here at Arizona's no, Family? I'm all good, Mark, and I do miss uh, Scottsdale uh, very much. I'm a member at Estancia, and I can't wait to get back out there next fall. Well, if you when you do come out, please let us know. We'll come track you down. I'd love to have you sit next to me for a couple minutes if you make a station visit. So good luck with the show, and uh, – yeah, God bless you and your family, man. What a, what a cool story about Gunner. All right, thanks so much, Mark. Have a great day. The Extra Point Podcast is a production of 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona.